elections. Uh, we had a number of technical aspects related to the elections that failed to meet local, regional, and international statutes related to the holding of elections. Uh, the elections fell far short of numerous provisions of the Constitution of Zimbabwe and um, the Electoral Act of Zimbabwe, among other uh, local laws. The election also fell short of the um, static principles and guidelines governing democratic elections and also the African Charter on Democracy, Elections and Governance. We had also raised these issues uh, prior to the elections, and it was um, a good thing that various uh, election observer missions, including the SADC observer mission, the African Union, the European Union, the Commonwealth observer mission, they all um, pointed to these issues uh, which we believe tainted the credibility of the elections. Now that this has happened, uh, we have had uh, this issue happening. Uh, we have had the disenfranchisement of uh, voters, the persecution of uh, local observers, uh, and we are witnessing uh, post-election violence, which continues to happen in Zimbabwe. Now, the question that everyone has at this point is that where is Zimbabwe going? What should happen? Should the current situation continue? Should we continue to see the persecution of human rights defenders? Should we continue to see uh, a government that resulted from an election that was not legitimate continue to rule the country? Um, what should SADC do now that its observer mission really, really justifiably and rightfully pointed out the, that the elections fell short of the various uh, guidelines. What should happen now that we have had some countries giving uh, these elections the thumbs up when it is clear that uh, the elections happened in an environment that would not have resulted in a credible result? To help us uh, discuss this uh, this morning, we have um, a rich panel of um, law lawyers, activists, and um, citizens of Zimbabwe who are going to, to help us um, unpack this issue. Um, so at this point, I would like to introduce our guest speaker uh, for this event uh, this morning. Our guest speaker is uh, Dion Vuguta. I hope I have um, pronounced that uh, correctly. Uh, she's an advocate of the High Court of Kenya, and uh, she's committed to the promotion of gender equality and women's empowerment. She also currently works with the African Women Leaders Forum, an organization that is dedicated to advocating for increased representation of women in political decision-making spaces and leadership positions. Uh, at that point, I would like to then also point out that um, the, one of the issues that was raised uh, by the observer missions was the um, lack of participation of women uh, in the election. Uh, it is unfortunate that in this election, we actually witnessed an decrease in the number of women who um, stood for positions. We also witnessed a decline in the number of women who participated as voters. Uh, this probably also points to the nature of the environment that was not friendly uh, for women. So still um, on Dion, um, she she's um, a really dedicated uh, human rights defender and um, an advocate uh, of the High Court of Kenya. I would like to ask uh, Dion to speak to us about uh, the, re the, the, the role of the region, uh, the Sardic region, the role of uh, African Union, and um, probably the role of the international community in resolving the issue in Zimbabwe. Uh, over to you, Dion. 
Thank you very much uh, for inviting me for this, uh, to this very important uh, conversation. It's truly an honor. Um, Dion Vukuts has introduced uh, speaking from Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, this topic is, is very concerning and it's at the heart of democracy. And, you know, the collective efforts to uphold princip uh, democratic principles. And um, I'm going to focus mostly on the role of uh, regional cooperation in uh, safeguarding democratic principles. And uh, just to note that um, I've, I've tried to follow the Zimbabwean elections and, uh, you know, uh, I watched with very keen interest as uh, the African Union, the Commonwealth, the European Union, SADC, uh, uh, shared preliminary statements regarding the electoral processes. And uh, these statements, even though, uh, you know, the tone could be different, but they all converged to one central message. And this was how these elections were conducted. And uh, one statement that really stood out for me was um, the SADC uh, criticism. Uh, and, you know, um, the government uh, probably expected that this criticism to arise from uh, other, other, other organizations like, uh, you know, the Europe European Union uh, uh, or the Commonwealth. But it did not expect uh, this criticism from SADC because, uh, you know, the government probably deems uh, SADC as being friendly, friendly in quotes. And, uh, you know, this selective approach uh, to external criticism really is significant because it underlines the importance of uh, international election observation. Um, and just, just to also talk about uh, the, the role of uh, international election observers. You know, there have been accusations about, uh, you know, specific organizations or, uh, or, uh, or, or journalists trying to distort the picture of the role of election observers. And uh, these challenges are not even uh, very specific to Zimbabwe, but to Africa at large. And um, even as, and, and it's, it's, it's very inspiring to see that SADC and the AU uh, as, as, as being supporters of countries sharing, uh, you know, uh, uh, African liberation challenges. Um, and uh, also, I, I'd just like to note that it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, a, it's a chance that uh, even as we look at this, uh, these statements, uh, we should not ignore certain things. For example, the delays in uh, opening polling stations, uh, primarily which was in uh, opposition leaning centers um, and, uh, and also uh, discrepancies raised about uh, transparency and accountability. So um, maybe as we go, uh, go on with this, uh, with this uh, conversation, it's, uh, it's important for us to really talk about the role of international observer organizations um, and uh, how, how they respond to such obstacles. Uh, for example, issuing periodic uh, assessments during pre-election periods, uh, which is a e very effective means of encouraging positive shifts in uh, policy and practice. Um, yeah, so uh, maybe I can hand over back to the host as we continue with the conversation. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dion. Um, that was a very comprehensive assessment. I think it is very critical that you pointed out that um, this issue is not specific to Zimbabwe. It is uh, something that we witness in Africa. And I think this is the point at which we, we, we are, where we are trying to figure out how best we can actually uh, utilize the Zimbabwe situation to rescue um, democracy in not only in Southern Africa, but in Africa as a whole. Um, I think it is uh, very important that um, elections, to note that elections are just the starting point of various other issues that will happen 
in a country, for example, uh, we have noted that the legitimate crisis in Zimbabwe is affecting, um, among other things, the economy. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, there's a lot of um, questions by prob probably potential investors. They do not know whether they need to come to Zimbabwe and invest at this point in time. Um, we also have a situation where uh, we have witnessed the unfortunate attempt uh, by our government to, to divide the SADC and make it look like uh, the report by SADC was, a, it was an individual report, and yet it was um, a culmination of the entire observer mission. Um, at this point in time, um, I would like to invite um, Whitney Mulovela. Uh, Whitney Mulovela is um, joining us from Zambia. He is a um, Zambian civil rights and governance activist. Um, as a lawyer, Whitney is uh, passionate about um, governance issues in the region and the continent at large. Uh, he has actually monitored Zimbabwean elections since 2018, uh, and uh, that really gives him a good understanding of um, the electoral uh, dynamics in Zimbabwe. And I think at some point, uh, Comrade Whitney will also uh, speak to us about um, his own assessment of the difference between the uh, 2018 elections in Zimbabwe and the uh, 2023 elections. Uh, over to you, Comrade Whitney. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Comrade. Um, are you able to get me? Are you yes, you are very clear. Are you able to get me? Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Okay. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, comrade. Uh, like you have rightly pointed out, I have been um, involved in monitoring the, the Zimbabwe elections. Now. Um, It seems uh, Comrade Whitney is having connectivity challenges. Uh, Comrade Whitney. It seems Comrade Whitney is having uh, connectivity challenges. So whilst um, we get to him and uh, get him to make him his uh, contri um, contribution, we would like to just um, ask uh, Comrade uh, Tendai Ruben Bofana to come in. Uh, Ruben Bofana is a social justice activist. He is in, he's written a lot about Zimbabwe's political, social, and economic issues. And um, I think uh, at some point, uh, he has become an authority in 
really shaping Zimbabwe's uh, narrative. Where are we going as Zimbabwe, comrade um, Bofana? Over to you. It seems yes, um, elections in Zimbabwe have been disputed for the past 23 years since the turn of the millennium. I don't believe that there's been any election in this country that has not been disputed. But with the 2023 elections, there is something that was outstanding. There were two things that I that way just glaringly out the outstanding the first one was that the electoral irregularities this time around they were just there they were just you know so flagrant that everyone could see them the government or the zanu pf government this time around did not even bother to pretend that these elections were going to be free and fair as already alluded to uh, to uh, by Diane and uh, even by the chair at the introduction, that the, 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 it, we start from the constitution, the electoral law was violated left, right, and center. The opposition was denied access to the electronic voters' role, which is very crit critical in order to, for, for them, for contesting parties, to, to, to verify and validate those that are there in the voters' role who will be participating in the election. We saw that the, uh, there was this shadowy organization that was formed, the FAS, you know, Forever Associate Zimbabwe, which was going out there, especially in rural areas, to openly intimidate uh, the electorate. Um, even on election day itself, there were desks, survey exit desks or something to that effect, that were set up just outside polling stations where voters were, 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 were requested, were asked, to submit their names and even asked which party they were going to vote for or which candidates they were going to vote for. We also the issue of um, the late opening of uh, polling stations in urban areas. That's another issue that has already been raised, which affected um, the opposition in a huge way. Because imagine a polling station opening 12 hours after its scheduled time, and even if there was an extra day, the 24th of August. That was uh, pronounced by the president to be, a, to be an election day. It was too late because it was not um, declared a public holiday, such that on that day most people had go, went about their their work there to attend to their to their employment. So th th there were so many irregularities that were there, such that the other, the second thing that was different with this election was that Sadak and the AU which had traditionally been known for ignoring such things, to ignoring vote rigging, for ignoring irregularities in Zimbabwe, this time they could not, they just could not ignore it. So that's why it was so shocking for the government of Zimbabwe to discover that in its prelimi preliminary reports, SADC was very con uh, uh, outspoken in its condemnation of the elections. So the question would be, what what next? You know, we we this report has to be dealt with by the by Sadat itself with the heads of state. It should not be a preliminary report or even with the final report. It should not be a report that will just be taken, put on the desk there and ignored. And that is a th that is something that we fear, uh, especially as Zimbabweans, as, as social justice activists and so forth. And that if Sadat is not going to take this report seriously. It's setting a very bad precedent for the rest of the region. Why I say so is that by undermining its own organs, its own 
its own arms because we know that the sad uh, the sad that election observer mission was sent by the ag organ or the troika on politics uh, security and defense so if you are going to ignore that and undermine another organ of of, of sadak what what precedents are we setting for the region the next country now and every other country in the region will know that they can easily violate their own constitutions their own electoral laws they can violate the principles and guidelines governing democratic elections that they signed up for in sadak knowing that there will not be any consequences if any other uh, sadak election observer mission in the future is to write a condemn a, 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 an adverse report pertaining to that country's elections they can simply come up and say hey you do anything for it in regard to Zimbabwe. why should we be taken why 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 should action be taken against us so that will lead to to, to a very bad precedent and we urge the southern african development community that this report uh, that was produced regarding Zimbabwe's election should not in, by any way in any means be ignored it has to be taken seriously sadak has to be seen for the first time that it has to, it can act they, it's not just a talk show or a, a club for leaders where they just sit around uh, come up with these fanciful ideas on democracy on elections which they are not able to follow through so my 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 um uh, point of view is that i urge uh, sadak to take this report very seriously to be seen to have teeth to ensure that they hold the government of zimbabwe and all its organs like the zimbabwe electoral commission to 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 account that's why we have seen just a few days ago the european union withdrew 5 million dollars us dollars in funding out of outrage because of the ways Uh, Zek and the Zimbabwe government as a whole conducted these elections. So we need a, a, such action from Sadak. We we need to say, see something that is meaningful, that is tangible, that can send a clear message to the Zimbabwe government and all its institutions that they can be and they will be held to account if they violate those guidelines that have been set up by Sadak, is the, the constitution of the country and the electoral laws. So whether we are going to have dialogue yes at the end of the day dialogue is very important but that dialogue should should be done in good faith it should not be a dialogue which is that's a facade for 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 protecting a, a, a particular entity in this in, in this regard the government of Zimbabwe because we have seen uh, where instances in other countries where we we say we are having dialogue but that dialogue is just is just a charade it's it's intended to to placate or or, or to to calm though the aggrieved party so that you don't take this issue further or to its logical conclusion and say no they are talking they are sitting down they are talking we need the dialogue if it's if there's going to be any dialogue to to be done in good faith where sad that stands its ground and say no the erring party here is the zimbabwe government and the zimbabwe electoral commission they are at fault they have to be held responsible and to account in any dialogue that comes out of it has to pr- bring with it something that is agreeable to even the the, the grieved parties the people of zimbabwe whether it's a it's a fresh election or whatever it is that comes out of that dialogue but it should not be a dialogue where we just postpone things and sweep things under the carpet when you say no we are these were just recommendations for future elections or for the 2028 elections no we have been having disputed elections in zimbabwe since 2000 for the past 20 years so this time around the what was uh, um, re, uh, produced by 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 sadak and the au and comesa and commonwealth in their in their reports should not be something for 2028 it should be something for now the government of zimbabwe has to be held to account to today now we should not continue to postpone because in 2028 the same thing is going to be repeated another observer mission report is uh, is produced and we say ah this time is for 30, for 20 uh, for 2033 or whatever year we'll be following and we we continue in this cycle and zimbabwe will always be a country known for disputed elections we cannot have that that will just lead to the continued suffering of the people of the of the country because there is no way our economy 
is going to stand on his feet when every time we have a disputed election, we have an illegitimate, an illegitimate, an illegitimate government in power that has no uh, support of its own people. The, they cannot succeed. The only way a government can succeed in running a country and uplifting the economy is when they have the, 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 the support and, and, the, and the, yes, the support and the backing of the people themselves. But they, if the people feel that this government is not legitimate and this government forced itself upon the people, there is no way that government is going to, to succeed. So if the region is serious, in having a successful Zimbabwe, which will result in a successful South Africa, in a successful Namibia, in a successful Zambia, in a successful Botswana, they now have to come in and stand firm and holding the Zimbabwe government to account. They cannot be left off the hook this time around. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mbufana. That was quite comprehensive. Uh, Zimbabwe needs a cure. Uh, we cannot continue having cycles of disputed elections. And um, like you rightly pointed out that SADAC, uh, probably for the first time, clearly uh, called this election for what it was, a sham. And um, that SADAC should actually act. It cannot just write a report, uh, show it, and let it gather dust because there will be a very, that will be a very bad precedent. Uh, we are having elections in uh, Eskwatini. Uh, this year, we're having elections in South Africa next year. Um, what precedence does this set? I, I just want to engage you there, uh, Mr. Mbofana. Uh, you spoke so much about that outside that should act, and probably we actually have uh, at some point, a precedence of uh, Zimbabwe's bullying of um, regional and uh, international bodies uh, to which it would have signed up to. We actually have a precedence where Zimbabwe previously advocated for and successfully led to the disbanding of the SADC tribunal uh, after its decision on the land question in Zimbabwe. Are we not? Uh, going for the same route uh, where probably SADAC might be bullied into uh, just um, submitting and probably uh, Zimbabwe, the Zimbabwean government finding its way. Uh, over to you, Mr. Mbofana. It seems uh, Mr. Mbofana might be having challenges uh, with hearing us in the network, but I'll just throw the question out uh, there to just um, uh, keep it at the back of our mind. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, 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 we can hear you now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm so sorry, I was having um, challenges uh, with uh, my gadgets here. And I don't know where I got cut because I think I was speaking at some point and then I just went missing. So, but what I was saying really was that I have been observing the Zimbabwe elections since 2018 and, uh, of course, the last elections. Like the previous speaker said, I think the, the irregularities in the 2023 harmonized elections were indeed very glaring. I will not go over to speak about the, the issues that were observed, of course, that were glaring, that were, of course, a breach of the African um, uh, Union uh, guidance on elections, or indeed the SADC, um, uh, SADC guidelines and principles around uh, democratic elections. But I think what is important here is that, uh, like the moderator was about to say, or is asking in the question, is there an effort to try and discredit the electoral observer mission, uh, especially the SADC observer uh, mission? And I think we are seeing uh, some uh, 
heightened desperation, I think, uh, by Harare, uh, I think we must be saying these things as they are, to try and discredit the um, Sadiq Observer mission. Uh, some of you who have been following keenly on the Zimbabwe uh, Broadcasting Corporation, I think there was a documentary that was broadcast by, um, by, uh, by that television station to try and discredit the observer report and reduce it to an observer report of Dr. Mumba and the President of the Republic of Zambia, which I think is really very unfortunate. Because I think, uh, truth be told, uh, if you have followed the, the reports that were issued by the EU, uh, by COMESA, by other regional observatory groups that observe the elections, I think most of the issues, there is some consensus. And therefore, it is not surprising, however, to see that there is an attempt to try and discredit the Sadiq Observer mission and reduce it to an observer mission of one person or as basically an observer mission of President Hichilema or an observer mission of Dr. Mumba. Um, I think the way these observer missions are crafted is clear that these are not in any way a one-man show. Uh, president Hichilema is only president or is only chair of the organ on, uh, on politics and obviously has no influence. When you look at the mission that was deployed in Zimbabwe, Dr. Mumba was only but one of the leads, but it comprised of 68 other uh, observers or uh, uh, of, uh, participants who were coming, drawn from other Sadiq uh, heads of uh, uh, head, uh, countries. So it's unfortunate to see the desperation to try and discredit the observer mission or the observer report, the preliminary report, which actually brings out some of the issues that even ourselves in our observation did observe. Uh, for instance, the observer mission, the static observer mission brings out the issue around the voters' role, uh, the lack of access to the voters' role uh, by stakeholders. I think this is a fact. The issues around the delayed voters uh, in Bulawayo and Harare, these are facts. The issues around freedom of assembly, uh, the use of the MOP or the maintenance of the Peace and Order Act uh, to try and stifle the meetings. These are, are facts that cannot be, uh, uh, we cannot uh, run away from. So I think that, um, like the previous speaker has uh, said, I think it is important that there must be a process of dialogue that must, uh, must begin to kick in. I think uh, it is not fair to say that uh, we must forget about all these glaring uh, irregularities that were reported and move on and tend to think that um, they will resolve themselves uh, going into the next elections. I think this was the same spirit that was talked about in 2018. Uh, there were parameters that were drawn to guide the 2023 elections, but those again uh, became a challenge. So uh, there is need for dialogue to address uh, these critical issues that have been raised in the electoral management system as pertains to the Zimbabwe question. As it is, I'm afraid that, uh, of course, uh, while elections might have ended and the results declared, the regime will obviously continue to suffer from legitimacy issues which cannot be washed away. And um, the report by the SADC and other observer missions is out there. And indeed, uh, there is a need for some dialogue to discuss uh, and agree on the best way forward to ensure that uh, there is some consensus and some legitimacy to the process. Thank you so much, Comrade. Uh, thank you uh, so much, Comrade Wittin. Um I think you raised very critical points about um, the role of SADAC in ensuring that um, uh, there is dialogue and uh, also uh, to ensure that um, Zimbabwe gets out of this legitimate crisis. I have one question for you, uh, Comrade Whitney. Uh, considering that uh, you rightly pointed out that um, the authorities in Zimbabwe are attempting to discredit the static report, uh, in a way also discrediting the institution of SADAC. Um, what do you see happening? Uh, is the institution going to capitulate 
uh, or is the institution going to continue insisting uh, in um, doing, carrying out the remedies that are available uh, to cure the Zimbabwean uh, problem? Okay, thank you very much. Um, as in terms of um, how I see it play out, um, I'll probably speak from the experience of knowing the current uh, chairperson of the Sadiq Troika or the Organ on Politics, uh, who is the current president of Zambia. I think uh, most of you might be aware that uh, he's a new entrant into the Sadiq, having um, vote, been voted in 2021 uh, uh, as a Zambian president. Uh, and uh, the little that we know about this president is that um, I think he's one that is extremely uh, principled. Uh, I think uh, you, you see the desperation that is there to try and discredit him in person. And you can see it from, uh, first of all, the articles that are coming from Harare uh, in the pro ZANU PF um, media. And the, the icing was, of course, the broadcast that was on um, on um, on, Z, on the Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation. But I think this is a man who tries to be very principled and stands by his words. And um, uh, the report, like I said, that has been produced by Sadiq, is not a Hichinama report. It's not a Dr. Mumba report. It's a Sadiq report. And I think this must be emphasized. We must uh, not reduce the Sadiq Observer mission to a report of either having been that of President Hichinama or, pre or of Dr. Mumba. I think it's a Sadiq organ report. And therefore, how I see it playing out is that uh, we are expectant that... Uh, the Sadiq uh, chair of the Troika will be able to call an emergency meeting to discuss the Zimbabwe uh, crisis. Because as it were, whether we like it or not, um, the current regime suffers a legitimate crisis uh, given the glaring irregularities that have been discussed in terms of uh, the elections that uh, just ended. So. It's in the best interest of uh, the government in Zimbabwe and, of course, uh, the Sadiq uh, Observer uh, Mission and, of course, the head of the Troika to try and find dialogue uh, for the parties in, the, in that election. And uh, going forward, I think and there were some uh, agreements bef after the 2018 elections that would guide the 2023 elections. Those guidelines were not followed. Uh, uh, clearly, again, uh, the, Z the Zimbabwe electoral commission i think failed the people of zimbabwe to be able to manage the elections in a free and fair and favorable manner without prejudice as proclaimed in uh, section 235 of the zimbabwean constitution so we are all looking forward to see what kind of leadership uh, the zambian president will provide to this process uh, because i think uh, to just wash it away will create a further problem that will actually even undermine the democratic uh, standing of uh, Zimbabwe and uh, further undermine the, you know, the legitimacy of the government in Zimbabwe. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Whitney. Um, we wait to see the leadership that uh, Zambia will provide. We wait to see what SADC will do uh, because clearly this cannot be washed away, as you said. I would like to just revert a little bit to Dion. Um, for those that no, might not have joined us earlier on, uh, Dion uh, is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. Uh, she's joining us from Kenya. And um, Kenya has had um, dialogue processes, has had dis disputed elections. Um, I just uh, want to ask you, Dion, what lessons can we draw from Kenya uh, with regards to this Zimbabwean issue. Over to you, Dion. Thank you very much. Um, uh, when you look at Kenya's history, there's been a, a series of uh, political and uh, ethnical conflicts. And one of the most significant ones was uh, the post-election violence that erupted after the 2007 disputed uh, presidential elections. And this violence left over a thousand people dead. Um, it displaced hundreds of thousands and uh, 
really cast a very dark shadow on the on the on the future of the country. So Kenya was left at a place where we could decide whether to choose uh, a path towards uh, reconciliation, peace, and a democratic process. And therefore, um, because of this, uh, uh, the country embarked on a dialogue process, which I believe uh, really uh, helped shape the political landscape of the country. So some lessons that I think could apply to Zimbabwe, one is inclusivity. It's important to consider even through the dialogue processes, uh, all the stakeholders involved. This includes the, the, the different political leaders and parties, uh, civil society representatives. There's need to listen to religious figures and uh, international mediators. The, the idea of inclusivity is to ensure that the diverse voices are heard and that there's legitimacy. My, the previous speaker have talk, has talked about legitimacy. Even as we ha even after the, the dialogue, the agreements that are made need to be legitimate. Another thing that I think really counted for Kenya was the role of um, uh, uh, of Kofi Annan, of the late Kofi Annan. Uh, you know, he, he was uh, a figure with reputation and a history of uh, conflict resolution. Can you still hear me? Yes, very much clearly so, um, yes. Dion. So uh, he was very instrumental in convincing uh, the disputing parties to come to the negotiating table. And uh, the role of mediators really is to leverage their experience to facilitate uh, productive discussions. Another, role, another important lesson is whether there is genuine commitment to the agreements. The, what resulted to Kenya's uh, successful dialogue process was the genuine commitment of uh, the parties. Um, and this led to, uh, to, to, for example, this National Accord and Reconciliation Act, which is a result of uh, this uh, negotiation, uh, which established a power sharing agreement between the two parties. And then um, also it led to, uh, to, to, to conversation around the new constitution. Another one is um, the role, one thing that really stood out is em empowerment of the civil society, uh, which provided uh, a platform for citizens' voices to be heard and uh, contribute to the process, uh, to their credibility and accountability of uh, the process. Another thing is transitional justice. When you talk about transitional justice, um, what happens um, with the, with the, you know, uh, different parties acknowledging their past wrongs, what uh, uh, promoting healing and preventing the recurrence of uh, violence. And then also one thing that really needs to happen is timely intervention. We should not allow this the the you know the situation to 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 escalate any further. The earliest engagement can you know help save uh, the democratic institutions. And also, once the agreements have been done and. Uh, the peace building and democratic uh, building efforts. Yeah, so I think uh, also uh, talking about regional support and engagement, like the AU, the, uh, the, the SADC, uh, play a very important role in supporting dialogue processes. And uh, their, their active involvement leads to credible outcomes and, uh, you know, discourages the... dialogue process from before. Thank you. Hello. Hi, uh, uh, Dion. Yes, you are, uh, you are still audible, but uh, there are some parts that are not coming out very clearly.
Dion, can you hear me? It seems that Dion is running into some connectivity challenges, but uh, she was speaking very much clearly about lessons that Zimbabwe can learn. I think this will not be the first time considering that uh, when Kenya had their elections in 2007 and they ended up in a dispute, Zimbabwe went on to hold their elections in 2008 and pretty much the same template was um, used back then uh, for our government of national unity after we had disputed elections in 2008. And I think... Um, we still continue to need to learn from them because even when they had their next elections, uh, they had disputes, but they had uh, they were resolved. So I think one of the key issues that she pointed out is the timely intervention, uh, and I think it goes back to what Whitney said earlier on that there is need for timely intervention before the situation deteriorates into. Um, Said that instability, I think we've continued to see post election crackdown on, on the opposition by the government of Zimbabwe. Uh, we have also continued to see a lot of uncertainty in the economy, among other things. And all of these are effects uh, of the illegitimate election. I think uh, uh, Dion pointed out critical issues like the need for inclusivity. Uh, this is a very critical issue in Zimbabwe, considering that. Uh, our government has been, and that is actually not fostered inclusivity in its way. Uh, she pointed out to diversity. Uh, I think there is need for everyone's involvement. The process should be legitimate. That means that it should have the thumbs up of every stakeholder in Zimbabwe. That is why even at the crisis in Zimbabwe coalition, we continue to point out that dialogue is not, should not just be between uh, politicians but should be dialogue by everyone in Zimbabwe, every stakeholder in the uh, Zimbabwe question. Um, she also spoke about the integrity of uh, the mediation process, uh, the commitment of everyone to a dialogue process. She also spoke about the issues of power sharing. I think it's a very critical issue in Zimbabwe, considering that uh, our government has continued to strengthen it its authoritarian rule, um, and I think that needs to be uh, pushed back uh, through such processes. And I think the critical issue that she also said is uh, the issue of transitional justice. In Zimbabwe, we have had phases of conflict, phases of um, uh, people being uh, oppressed and repressed, not just uh, political issues, but also economic um, issues where we have had people who have lost their savings. So, Zimbabwe has got a huge need for transitional justice in every every spe um, sector that is political, social, and economic. So I think the Clarion Call is on SADAC to ensure that there is um, inclusivity. There is a process where Zimbabwe walks out of this situation, and it will be a precedent not just for Zimbabwe but for SADAC as a whole. I would like to revert uh, to Comrade Whitney Mulawela. Uh, to just give us a bit of some remarks before we go to Comrade uh, Chengitai. Thank you, Comrade. Um, and because I'm running away, just to say thank you so much for the opportunity to have had a chance to speak to the Zimbabwe question. But in my uh, concluding remarks, I did want to emphasize the point that uh, I think it's in the interest of, uh, of SADC to find a lasting solution to the Zimbabwe question, because uh, clearly, I think the crisis in Zimbabwe is having a critical toll on the region itself, uh, both economically, socially, and now we are seeing even diplomatically. Uh, because obviously now, uh, if you are a follower of, uh, of politics, uh, I think there is obviously a brewing diplomatic row between Zambia and Zimbabwe. Uh, arising from the documentary that was aired on um, on the Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation. So I think before the situation uh, completely degenerates, I think 
it is in the interest of SADC and the African Union to address this problem and uh, uh, once and for all. And I think the issue around dialogue is critical because I think there are fundamental issues that need to be addressed if Zimbabwe is to have a free and fair election. And like uh, all the observer missions uh, talked, I think there are issues around the constitution that need to be addressed. And of course, the question around the independence of the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission to manage an election uh, in a free and fair manner. So I think these are issues and we are hopeful that um, uh, Sadiq can quickly move and address these issues as soon as possible. So thank you so much. Uh, but also, I think also it's uh, also incumbent upon us as uh, civil actors to try and uh, put pressure on our governments uh, in uh, our various spaces to try and address uh, the problems that are in Zimbabwe. Because the, the, the problems affecting the people of Zimbabwe affect us also as citizens of, of Zambia, as citizens of SADC. So it's incumbent upon all of us to ensure that uh, we work towards finding a lasting solution the Zimbabwe question. So thank you so much, comrade, and uh, blessed day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wissu. Uh, the problems in Zimbabwe are the problem for every other Saudi country, every other African country, and the international community at large. And there is need for a cure. I think the this discussion is really clearly pointing out to the fact that there is need for dialogue. Zimbabwe's challenges cannot be solved um, without a dialogue. And I think it is coming out clearly that the problems in Zimbabwe have been long standing. And this election only sought to expose how much uh, and how deep the challenges in Zimbabwe are. Uh, I would, before I go to Chengetai, I would like to just ask Jesse Kiwata. Uh, from the Women's Academy for Leadership and Political Excellence to just come in and tell us uh, where are the women in all this. We have actually witnessed a situation where the political participation of women in Zimbabwe um, went down in this election. And I think there's need to go back to the drawing board uh, in whatever processes that Zimbabwe is going to undertake uh, to just foster increased participation of women. Over to you, Jess. Thank you, Tapio. Can you hear me? Very loud and clear. All right, thank you so much. Um, so, as well, we have noticed a steady decline in the numbers of women taking up public elected positions from 2018 to 2023, and they've been steadily uh, dropping ever since, with 2023 having the lowest numbers of women political candidates. And what we observed from the results of the just ended election is that male political leaders are uninterested in opening the political space to women unless they're just cheerleaders. Um, just to quote an Al Jazeera article that spoke about but how Zimbabwean women's role in politics has been diminished to that of a cheerleader. So in the 2023 harmonized elections, we had 637 contestants who were vying for the National Assembly seats, but only 70 of the contestants were women. In contrast, um, only 22 women won parliamentary seats. And then um, the total number of women in uh, members of women members in parliament is lower than the 25 women who won parliamentary seats in 2018, which is shocking because in 2013, we adopted a constitution that compels gender equality, but then it seems the further we go, the the, the more that the numbers of women in, politi in political leadership are dropping. And currently in cabinet, we have only six women out of 23 ministers. In local authority, um, we had 1,970 contested seats and women only took up 246 seats and we think that is very worrying and we can definitely say that we have a crisis in terms of women representation and i think we can all agree based on conversations prior to the election online and offline that the election was a two-man race i personally do not hear anyone you know talking about elizabeth valerio even though she was the only woman contesting for the presidential seat everybody was talking about uh, nelson chamisa's chances or about uh, emerson nagawa's chances but then no one even mentioned the fact that we have only one female who's running for the presidential seat now this year 
women's participation in elections was hindered by several factors such as political violence and as well but we found that there was a surge in cases of politically motivated violence from the day that the election date was proclaimed you know we had high numbers of reports of intimidation harassment threats cyberbullying and threats made against women candidates and uh, women who were spouses of candidates and these acted as a deterrent to their participation in the election additionally we also had case of human rights violations which we found to be pep uh, which we found to be papering the pre and post election periods and this affected women participation negatively and currently women um, are still being followed they have been threatened they have been verbally and physically abused and they're having their homes burnt down and as well we are saying that if this pattern continues we're going to see an even lower number of women participating in 2028 going forward unless there's some kind of intervention that is made and then the pattern changes Secondly, the issue of nomination fees for candidates were very high, and as well, we feel that it, uh, uh, the nomination fees did not reflect the economic reality of many women in Zimbabwe, because um, fees for council candidacy were $100, um, for members of parliament it was $1,000, and for the presidential candidacy it was $20,000. Now, given the lack of financial capacity of women, scores of them were forced to drop out of the race, which means that already we had a very low number number of women who could afford to even get to the um the beginning of the race now we also have women candidates who faced um challenges with finance and resource mobilization to further their campaigns and this also affected their um, ability to campaign successfully and our research also shows that many women candidates gave up on their goal to run for political leadership as they lacked the finances and resources to um, contest for political presidency we also saw that intra-party patriarchy also affected women's chances at being selected to run for public elected positions under their party's tickets as male candidates were favored and women candidates were requested to step down to pave way for male candidates and this was um, quite prevalent during last uh, during the primary elections so with these findings we have a set of recommendations that we think um, can be implemented so that we can ensure an increase in women representation in political leadership and so we uh, recommend that um, the country changes the electoral voting system from first past the post to proportional representation with the with the zebra list format as this guarantees gender equality and also ensures that citizens vote for political parties not individuals and we feel that it will also insulate women from political violence and vote buying which is another issue that also affected women's chances at um, getting into the political race we also recommend that um, as civil society we engage some of the stuff that we want to focus on. Thank you so much. I'll end here. Thank you so much, Jesse. I think you really spoke very well about the issue of inclusivity. Uh, Dion spoke about that as a lesson uh, from Kenya uh, that everyone has to be part of uh, national processes. And I think what you really spoke about is a culmination of a, a country whose government is fostered. Uh, policies that do not uh, promote inclusivity, uh, like was earlier pointed out that this election was just um, one thing that eventually exposed the deep-seated challenges that Zimbabwe has faced even in previous election uh, processes, uh, challenges that Zimbabwe has faced post um, the 2017 military coup uh, and I think what is coming out clearly is that we cannot continue like this as a country. We cannot continue to be a problem in the region. We cannot continue to be a problem country in Africa. We cannot continue to be a problem country in the international community. There is need for a cure. And I think at this point in time, the uh, ball is in the court of SADC. Uh, it should act and it should be seen to be... Uh, fostering the very values that um, member countries uh, signed up to. It should be seen to be promoting the very values of the founding fathers of SADC, who during the liberation struggle phases of southern African countries, they all clearly say that as a region we need to stand by the principles of uh, democracy, the principles of one man, one vote. But I think what we are seeing in Zimbabwe is a clear result 
and uh, a, a clear contrast of what these founding fathers um, really fought for. Uh, at this point in time, I would like to open the um, floor uh, to if anyone who might want to make contributions. Uh, I think at some point with Chengitai waiting to be a speaker, but I don't seem to see him in the um, in the spaces. Uh, but I've also seen that um, Fortune Cook, they were from the NGO for, from the National Transitional Justice Working Group, he has joined us. So I would like to just uh, give it to him to speak to us about the importance of uh, uh, national transitional justice process. I think um, it having been pointed out that Zimbabwe needs dialogue. I think uh, Zimbabwe also needs a dialogue that involves a transitional justice process because we have uh, so many of our citizens who have um, experienced political violence, we have experienced tribal and ethnic um, violence, and these have not been resolved. Perpetrators have continued to walk spot free and enjoy uh, doing these things with the impunity that um, they get from the government. And uh, we, in this just um, ended election, we've actually seen abductions happening. So what is coming out is that we are seeing a continuation of what Zimbabwe has been. And it seems as if without the intervention of regional board like SADC, and rather the timely intervention, the situation can continue, can only continue to be worse. Uh, fortune over to you. I, I think Fortune is having challenges, but I see Boss Salani has requested to speak. Uh, you can go ahead, Boss Salani. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, can you just confirm, host, if you can hear me properly? Very loud and clear. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, honestly, uh, I, I always enjoy these spaces. So thank you so much, uh, Crisis and Zimbabwe Coalition, for always having these very powerful uh, and um, informative spaces. Thank you so much for that. And I'd also like to thank uh, all the speakers who've spoken, uh, the guest speakers there. I, I've been listening and I'm, I've taken a lot of what you've uh, spoken about. I just wanted to um, talk about the issue that the host mentioned there when we talk about violence. And um, there's a couple of things that I've realized. Um, if we look at violence for what it is, violence is not just the acting, the acting part of it, the action part of it, where people get uh, beaten up, abducted, or the, the action part. It's not. It doesn't just stem from there. We have to look at the violence in the words, the the manner in which the politicians or our politics of the day handle words. Words are violent, especially if you've got violent words. What you end up getting is a situation where people act out those violences. And this is what we're seeing. And what makes it so worrying is the fact that uh, it's becoming a normal thing. People seem to think that, oh, um, it, it, is, it is needed in the current climate for people to behave in such a way or to say the things that they say. I mean, think about words where people will say, oh, crush them like lice, or they'll say, my baboon. Already, we're taking away that humanistic nature where we're supposed to be respectful of each other, our human rights. We, we deserve to speak to each other in a respectful way. And I feel because of a lot of that that we've witnessed in on our elections, of course, and people will say, oh, it, it's required, it's needed because we've been suffering for, uh, you know, 40 plus years. But what you have to realize is, it's, it doesn't help us to keep feeding into the violence itself. We need to become better. We need to be more acquainted with the manner in which we should speak to each other. And then, then this then trickles down and then involve or informs the manner in which we're able to have dialogue with those that we may see as our perpetrators or those who persecute us. There has to come a point in which there's a meeting, a communication that takes place. But the worrying thing now that you see 
uh, you have that nature where, if, especially when we look at our politicians, let's look at the opposition, for instance. They're not united. Um, there's, no, there's no one yet who's come to unify it. Oh, sorry, host, I was muted there. Is everything okay? Host? Uh, you can quiet. That must have been... Okay, um, a mistake. No, no, no problem. It happens mistake. all the time to me. No, it's okay. It's okay. Thank you. Uh, what I was just saying there was that we, you know, politicians, especially the, those in opposition, we need the, our leaders to start coming together under one banner. What, what I've, I keep on hearing, and this is the kind of another issue where it looks as if the language that we see of the day is people saying, why don't you all come and join one banner? You all need to go and join like the main opposition which is triple c and 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 it's quite worrying because the moment people see that people or, or political parties such as like mdct you've got uza you've got all these other political parties that are there the moment they try to do something there's kind of this violent nature in which uh, citizens or people behave towards them to say no you are an agent of um, the enemy even the word enemy when you call someone an enemy you're inevitably separating yourself from them you're put your ju you're judging them already and it becomes hard for someone who's been called an enemy to be the one that you're going to say, oh, we want them to do what's best for us. They, it, it changes the whole uh, narrative and the, way, and the manner in which our politicians or our government or our political parties and their members start to behave towards one another. And this has become so, mo so much worrying, especially with the elections that we've just seen. We're seeing a lot more of that. And the problem you have when you have a situation where uh, the politics or us as citizenry are not sort of directing our politicians and our polit uh, political parties in the manner in which they need to ensure the greater good of every single citizen. This is what's important. It's not about what's important for ZANU-PF, C or MDC or any other political party. It's about what is best for the Zimbabwean citizen. Because when you take away those political jackets, what are you left with being a Zimbabwean? And that has to be the core... Um, method or the core ambition or aim which is to represent each and every one of us as Zimbabwean citizens so if you have that problem where now you have people or those who have understood this kind of uh, wisdom and are attempting to come to a point where they can communicate with the opponents, or even the word opponents there, someone might say, ah, why are you calling them opponents? But yeah, they're from different uh, political um, jackets. So at the end of the day, you're definitely competing with them, right? One wants to lead, the other, everybody wants to lead. So if one is leading and the others aren't, there will always be that kind of competitive nature between them, which is to be Expected. But the question then becomes, are they are you able to communicate with your competitors? Are you able to come to a ta to a table where you start to recognize a need for working together for the greater good? Is this possible? Or do people just see it as they have to be completely removed? We have to be in control. That is all that we want. We don't want any middle ground. And this becomes a problem because the, the people who continue to suffer is us, the citizenry, based on the fact that we have people or, or leaders that are un incapable of sitting at the table and putting their grievances or their personal issues aside and working for us. So th this always ends up trickling down to the motivations of these political parties. One motive will be as long as we get into power, that's what we're interested in. Once we're in power, everything will work. And they'll tell you all manner of lovely stuff that you'd love to hear. But if you look at the reality of that, is it possible to be achieved just like that? I mean, there are others who say, ah, once we're in power, the economy will become great. The sanctions will go. Is this truly what happens? Because we know that there are red tapes and there are processes before you get to that stage but the, you see that the it's it's more of a situation where people just want to give people what they're hoping for tell them what they want to hear and we're not being honest with each other so in my closing i'll just say i'd really wish there was a situation where we as citizens we can come to a point where we tell our leaders that without that kind of communication between you guys without that kind of agreement on one thing at least stand on one thing together put your grievances aside then we'll start to see a, a different way of handling these polit the political nature in our country and hopefully remove that toxicity, remove that violent uh, undertones and even the violence itself and then come to a point where we can all work together for the greater good of all Zimbabweans. That's my wish. And above all, 
I truly hope that we'll have more and more women coming up into the forefront. We've seen that there's been a decrease in women participation in these uh, leadership roles, and it's, I'm quite saddened to see that. But I hope we'll have more women going forward, women that will help to propel our future in, um, in a better way in the years to come. Thank you so much, host. I'll land there. Uh, thank you so much. Um, that was quite powerful. Uh, we're talking about eight language, um, a very, very um, big challenge in Zimbabwe. Uh, I'm sure if you go to the comments uh, on our Twitter right now um, of the people who are responding to these Twitter spaces and the contributions, you can see a lot of um, eight speech there. Uh, and so before I ask jo Danny to come in, I just want to go back to Dion a little bit to just briefly tell us how did Kenya deal with the issue of hate language? Because we all know that in countries like Rwanda, which have also done very good and effective uh, transitional justice processes, hate language was one key issue that was pointed out. And it is one of the reasons why um, the conflict in Rwanda escalated uh, in 1994. Over to you, Dion, before I come to Denny. And before you come in, Dion, those that would like to speak, just send requests so that we can approve you and be able to, you are able to speak in time. It seems that uh, Dion is not able to uh, immediately respond, but I uh, will pack that question uh, and just go straight to Dion. Sorry. Can you um, make your so, with, thank you. Uh, with regards to um, measures that Kenya has undertaken on hate speech and uh, incitement during elections, um, one, um, it's still it's still a journey. Uh, because they still hate speech during elections, especially targeted uh, to women. But one of the steps that Kenya has taken is one through enacting and uh, enforcing laws that uh, are, are supposed to curb hate speech. One is the um, we have a National Cohesion and Integration Act, which criminalizes hate speech, um, ethnic contempt, and uh, any kind of incitement or discrimination. So perpetrators can face uh, fines and imprisonment if they are found guilty. And then uh, under that, there's also uh, a National Cohesion and Integration Commission, um, uh, which is uh, an agency that uh, promotes and facilitates uh, equality of opportunity, good relations, harmony, and peaceful coexistence among diverse uh, ethnic groups in Kenya. It monitors hate speech. It investigates uh, complaints and takes action against uh, individuals or groups that are found to engage in um, hate speech. And then also the government works with media houses to ensure that they adhere to... Um, sorry, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, Dion. Very long. Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Yes, Dion, we can hear you. We can continue. Sorry, Dion. Yes, the host is saying that he can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. And uh, I was talking about media regulation, um, where the government needs to work with media houses. Of course, media houses need to be independent, but the government needs to ensure that they are there to ethical standards during elections. Uh, so media houses that are found to promote uh, hate speech or incitement uh, should face sanctions or legal action. Um, we also have, under the Election Act, we have... Um, we have an election offense uh, regulations where the law specifically addresses uh, election related offenses, including hate speech during campaigns and during elections. It outlines the penalties of uh, offenses related to incitement and hate speech uh, during um, 
electoral processes. Then there's also streamlining of uh, of campaigns, which is the educational campaigns. So Kenyan authorities are working together with civil society organizations and uh, other international partners uh, conduct public awareness campaigns to educate citizens about the dangers of hate speech and uh, the importance of encouraging peaceful coexistence. And these campaigns uh, help to, you know, discourage the use of uh, device, divisive uh, languages. And then there's also the importance of uh, community dialogue. Um, for example, Kenya is a very ethnic country. So we have efforts being made to promote inter-ethnic dialogue and reconciliation, especially at the grassroots level, where local leaders and community organizations, uh, both men and women, work together to, um, you know, have have a role in fostering uh, understanding and peaceful relations between the different um, ethnic groups. Um, also. Just to note, uh, with social media, there is a lot of uh, hate speech, and it's it's become a very growing concern. And uh, this requires uh, more comprehensive strategies to address digital hate speech. And um, I think, uh, based on this, I think those are some of the lessons uh, from Kenya. It's not we are not there yet, but from what the work that is ongoing at the grassroots level, this is. Uh, this, I think, is something that, um, you know, uh, helping or even with more improvement will deal with uh, hate speech during uh, election period. Thank you so much, Dion. Uh, we are not here yet. We are not, we are not there yet. Um, I think um, you have really pointed out clearly that um, Kenya has set up uh, very strong institutions. Uh, a key lesson for Zimbabwe because we've seen the undermining of very, the very local institutions that are supposed to deal with, among other things, hate speech, human rights violations. And uh, right now, an attempt to even undermine uh, a regional institution. Uh, so I think there's need uh, going forward for the respect of institutions that are meant to safeguard and protect democracy. And I think you also pointed out to the fact that there is then the rule of law, and unfortunately in Zimbabwe, we, whilst in Kenya you might not yet be there, in Zimbabwe we have not even started to speak about the respect for of, uh, rule of law, and I think that's where we're supposed to go um, to ensure that the law is not used as a weapon to suppress the opposition and civil society but rather to ensure that people are, are brought to uh, book when they commit a crime and uh, regardless of their political affiliation, regardless of their religion, among other things. Uh, so I think we've got so many lessons to learn. And I think we keep going back to the fact that SADC is our institution, should be the one to really start to foster that and push Zimbabwe into a situation where we have to sit down and talk to each other as a country because uh, like has been pointed out, this is spilling into the uh, entire region in so many ways and there's need for a cure. I will go to Denny. Uh, I've been keeping you waiting for some for a long time. Uh, and whilst Denny come in, um, those that want to contribute, please just send uh, the request to speak, uh, press the request to speak button and uh, we'll approve and we will have this conversation. Oh, thank, you. thank you, Crisis uh, in Zimbabwe. Um, wow, very powerful uh, uh, presentations that have come through here and uh, all of them are absolutely correct. Uh, so I'm not going to add anything on top of that. Now, the issue here is post-election legitimacy crisis. We have been in a legitimacy crisis since 20, 2002, and uh, it's continuing. We have been disputing elections since then, and we have, been dis we have disputed the just-ended one a little over a month ago, a little under a month ago. And this trend is going to continue, and there seems to be now a cycle uh, that has been established here. 
And if you look at this cycle and the, you understand how government works and how they are legitimized and how they are recognized, you'll find that, you know, as an OPF doesn't have to get legal uh, <laughs> legitimacy. <laughs> they can have de facto legitimacy. Like, okay, fine. You guys are not protesting. You guys are not doing anything. Your leaders are not, you know, pushing us hard enough. So we are the ones in charge. And then life goes on as, as usual. And what opened? So we need to uh, start addressing or start looking at the kind of things that allow us to address or bring the country to a head where we begin to now discuss issues of freedom or democracy and so forth. But now freedom and democracy are such bitter things to attain. You don't pick them up in a garden of roses. It, it, it's, it, it's unheard of. Wherever you have heard freedom being established, be it is in the United States of America, in the United Kingdom, in, in China, there was always a struggle that brought whoever was oppressing the people to the table or got them kicked out. Now, without some kind of leverage to then say, this is what we want. There's been a lot of talk of a transitional authority. That doesn't come just like that because we talked about it. There has to be a conversation whereby we start to uh, start to you know take actions that bring everybody to the table, that make it impossible, <laughs> block all the other avenues and leave one avenue, which is you know getting to the table and establishing a, a completely new way of doing things. Now there are several things that people are continuously avoiding and continuously relying on political administrations and leaderships and all so forth. And that is, you know, uh, applying the right kind of pressure to the government of Zimbabwe currently. The way things are right now, we are not going to get anything. Freedom is a painful thing. Even Kwameka, they always say, uh, you know, the tear of liberty is watered by the blood of, of patriots. Now, I'm not talking about civil war here or chaos or you know, anything like that. But I'm talking about, you know, real brave, real difficult decisions which need to be made. Now, first of all, to get to this point, citizens need to get away from this partisan approach that we have taken in Zimbabwe. I'm DUZ, I'm UZA, I am MDCT, I'm ZANU PF. We need to stop that Zimbabwe is much bigger than these organizations who all of them, if you look at what political parties are designed for, are just searching for power. That's why many people around uh, 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 the Zimbabwean political discourse came to a conclusion that the GNU was a political agreement between you know, the parties that were involved there, and it had nothing to do with the people. And that's because us, the people, are not engaged enough are not setting down the ground for proper engagement, for proper, you know, uh, uh, pressure that allows these politicians to start to, you know, move towards creating a country where everybody can partake and participate. As long as we are all blocked out and limited to uh, Twitter spaces and little gatherings and, you know, crisis for Zimbabwe is there doing its thing and whatever. As long as we don't have that and we don't have a round table the way we come and, you know, apply real pressure, whether it is... Um, uh, civil disobedience, whether it is, you know, a national consensus where every citizen begins to say, okay, no, we are not participating in your election until we have these things in place. Uh, until we get that kind to reach that level of political maturity, we are always going to be in trouble. And the legitimacy crisis is going to be so normalized until, you know, this becomes the norm and trend. And it already has become a norm and a trend. So I, I think... It's about time we dropped our political jackets. It's about time we started thinking of Zimbabwe as something much bigger than what it is. It's about time we, when we host these spaces, when we meet in our different uh, organizations and so forth, we start to discuss things which, which, which enlighten people. Our beloved constitution is probably one of the world's most, most well-written constitutions out in this continent or perhaps even in the world. It's such a beautiful document. I think we need to enlighten people what it means to have these, this Bill of Rights, what it means to have the three organs of state and separation of powers, what it means to have a proper democracy, what it means to have an individual being respected, right? Because those things, once we understand those things, we will realize that we have an urgent matter to address as a country. We can't wait for miracles 
we have to step in and do something. We have to sacrifice. We have to make hard decisions. Now, this is a dictatorship we are dealing with. That is a dictatorship. Not, no questions about it. If people will come and give it different names. It's a dictatorship, and dictatorships don't want to lose power. And the things we are discussing now, you know, hate speech, let's stop that, uh, democracy, proper elections, are kind the kind of things that will get that dictatorship kicked out of power. And they'll never allow it unless real pressure is applied, real genuine pressure. Now, I am for. I am for, you know, uh, citizens coming down, dropping their political jackets and then coming to put pressure, civil disobedience. I'm talking peaceful uh, mass protests. I'm talking about, you know, civil engagement, which, you know, uh, uh, which, which is action based, which uh, uh, brings, uh, you know, these politicians to a head where we say, OK, where the politician has to sit down and say, OK, if we still want to exist <laughs> whether it's Triple C, whether it's DUZ, whether it's Zanu PF, if we still want to exist, these people are not going to support us if we continue with this. They want A, B, C, D, and we have to deliver this. Otherwise, we are out. And then there's a new, and, 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 and people fill in this vacuum of power, which we, 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 with leaders that are concerned with, uh, with, with the bigger picture, which is Zimbabwe. So until our discourse changes, until our narrative changes, until our actions change, until we drop the political jackets, we are stuck here. And Zanu PF right now, legitimate or not, they are our de facto government. And that's that's all they want. That's all they need. It's a dictatorship. They don't want you to like them. They don't need you to like them. They just want power. They want to be corrupt. They want to loot. They want to take away your civil liberties because your liberty is their ticket out of power. <laughs> and they can't allow that. And they can't allow that. And whether we put in legislation that says no hate speech, and we have very beautiful, beautifully crafted laws in Zimbabwe, to be honest, which address many of the, the things that we discussed here. But if, as, if, as long as citizens are not putting the kind of pressure that I'm talking about here, it's not going to matter. Rule of law is not going to matter. We really need to engage our, our leaders or engage new leaders <laughs> so to speak because we are looking at the bigger picture which is the life of our beloved country which right now is in a sorry state there's no liberty to speak of there was a video of someone being whacked with a with a, with a, with a, with a, with a, with a boulder or whatever the hell that was bones being broken that story never made the kind of headlines or didn't get citizens incensed enough to start to, to, to put pressure and say, oh, this is unacceptable. Once one of us is being hit like that, once one of us is being thrown in jail over a year for a crime they, don't, they didn't commit or for over four years for a crime that doesn't exist, once that one person is down, all of us, we are down. And if we do not register our, dis our, 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 our discontent and our anger in that regard, the, the Zanu PF will continue to push the envelope. And the thing often is seen about Zanu PF, they can push envelopes. When you think things are bad, no, 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 no. They make it worse. It gets worse and worse and worse because it is, it is, it is, their, it is their agenda <laughs> to make it <laughs> such that, you know, they cripple citizens' ability to speak citizens' ability to act, and citizens' ability to come together. So it's about time, civil society, crisis in Zimbabwe, you, <laughs> you guys are quite big, uh, you know, political parties, churches, and especially citizens come together and really come to a consensus that, look, this is a dictatorship. Elections alone are not going to save us. We need to put the kind of pressure that creates a proper election. Transition authority is a good idea and it's been spoken of since 2000. I think it's been the issue since Zimbabwe was was born, actually. That's how you got the Unity Accord. That's how you got the GNU. That's how, it's, been, it's been spoken of enough times, but at the behest of politicians and their quest for power and their quest for, for, for gaining access to our beloved state so they can do their shenanigans. That has to stop. It can only stop if we start to engage, act, and completely refuse things which are completely absurd. Why is someone in jail for over a year on, without being given bail? Yet bail is a constitutional right. That's, that, that's, uh, that's unacceptable. But we sit here, go about our life, teaching guava and guava town. That's, that's, that's ridiculous. That's, that, that's not going to give us freedom. 
it's a painful process and we must embrace this pain if we want to eat the fruit of freedom. I'll, uh, I'll end there. Many thanks. Thank you so much, Jardim. Very powerful. We need to act. We need to put the politicians in the corner and we need to stand up as Zimbabweans regardless of our political affiliation. That is very profound because um, we have not really had that sense of nationhood and that's simply because our political leaders have divided us, they have continued to divide us, they have continued to use suppression as a form of dividing us. And I think you spoke very strongly about the need for action uh, beyond the words uh, to push and force the government to relent. Uh, I think as we go towards wrapping up uh, this very beautiful discussion, I will ask Chengitai to just come in and make his contribution and then we can wrap up uh, this discussion. Thank you, moderator. Um, and, and greetings to everyone. Uh, yes, my contribution would uh, start with uh, a call for us to completely understand our problem, um, or rather our national problem, a Zimbabwean problem, which in my view requires a, a, a Zimbabwean solution as much as we also would appreciate intervention from elsewhere. Um, I think for the for the benefit of those who obviously disagree with the opposition, I'll use that as an umbrella or bracket word, because it is the opposition which is not happy uh, about the outcome of an election. It is important that um, we 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 define what we are saying when we are talking about a legitimacy crisis. By definition, we are saying uh, it, it arises from from a disputed elect electoral process. Uh, and when we have a significant number of people who are doubting the election's in integrity, um, that would be, in our view, a, a legitimacy crisis, even though I know that uh, those who are in power right now would uh, disagree to say we don't have a legitimacy crisis. That's why I tried to make an effort to define what we are saying as a legitimacy crisis. So now, uh, on... on, on um, on the back of that uh, definition which I have just submitted, the question then becomes, do we have a legi legi legitimacy crisis? Yes, we do. Where does it emanate from? Um, number one, the military coup, which brought about uh, a complex uh, dimension to our politics uh, in, in, in November of 2017, the fact that uh, Emerson Monangagwa came into power through a military coup through the subversion of our constitution. Uh, it comes as no surprise why today we have uh, uh, more than 150 violations to our constitution and the Electoral Act uh, in this plebiscite, which has become disputed according to the definition that I've submitted and, of course, uh, how we are all seeing it. Secondly, um, we would be pointing at a faulty and unlawful delimitation report, which is going, sadly, it's going to last us two electoral cycles, which means the 2023 um, disputed election, which we have just come out from, and um, the, the, the next election, which is going to be in 2028. Um, that would be number, number two. Uh, of course, there are a lot of other things that happened during uh, um, uh, th this uh, process, which some have refused to call an election. As a matter of fact, our position as the MDC was that we did not want to participate in this election. Uh, we were, however, forced indirectly by ZEC because they refused to withdraw the candidature of our presidential candidate. Uh, but we also had glaring... Uh, uh, anomalies and violations, a record 87 candidates rejected by both the courts uh, and also uh, the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission. Uh, there was selective application of the law. Um, another thing is that ZANU-PF seems to have uh, improved their um, fight to cling on to power uh, by force or by, by hook and crook, by whatever means. 
and it, this time around it has been more of lawfare than anything else this election was relatively peaceful uh, because we didn't get uh, much of what we used to get previously from other elections where we had lots of people dying you remember in uh, the runoff with more than 300 people who got killed uh, but this time around they, they decided to take it the other route which which was lawfare you realize that we had the judiciary at the center of uh, determining how this electoral process was going to be run and that is uh, against public policy uh, that is against the very ethos of our liberation struggle which sought to uh, bring about the one man one vote uh, franchise and that was taken away from us when uh, we had uh, 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 the 87 candidates. This is obviously on the part of the MDC. 87 candidates struck off an election. That's um, more than half of all the candidates across the country. Uh, but of course, we cannot rule out the harvest of fear where you then saw your, your fans uh, coming in, intimidating people, lots of glaring uh, uh, um, anomalies. I could go on and on. Some of the speakers have already uh, 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 spoken to those things. But now, the more important question is, what then do we do? A Zimbabwean solution to these Zimbabwean problems, which everyone is, is talking about. Uh, well, of course, the first thing would be for us to find one another through dialogue. I like the people who have been talking about dialogue, 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 dialogue. And it is important for us at this point to then say, what sort of dialogue are we talking about? We don't want an elite kind of pact where you have political parties engaging in dialogue we want even non-political actors to be part of this dialogue so that they can also come and <clears throat> diffuse certain uh, um, situations particularly the military complex to our politics it's one complex that we have not really had enough discourse around we talk about zanu pf but in our view we feel that the military has actually become more important uh, 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 in the fate in our fate look this is why you saw Emerson Monangagwa campaigning outside ZANU PF structures because the military had a grip on, on, on has a grip, not had a grip, has a grip on ZANU PF, has a grip on how the affairs of the country are run. And it's about time that we should really pay serious attention to the military complex in, in, in our politics. Otherwise, uh, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are almost not going anywhere. I know that there's been calls for fresh elections in Zimbabwe. But we feel that as a party, this is completely far-fetched and unreliable. We feel that it's misleading people that uh, there is any possibility of a fresh election coming in Zimbabwe that is far-fetched. Even calls for, I know my brother may disagree with me, Danny, you were saying the calls for, for a national transition authority. Uh, I would say that it's very unrealistic. Respectfully, I disagree because I feel that it's unrealistic and of doubtful constitutional validity uh, because we already have a cabinet in place. It has been established. That alone brings in a very complicated uh, uh, constitutional conundrum. But the more important thing, is, is, as I've said, this does not mean that I'm throwing away uh, 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 you know, uh, submissions from others to say, look, what then would be our solutions? I feel that the call for National Transitional Authority is a bit too late if it had come before the election, particularly when there was serious attention, serious focus on the delimitation report. We, however, did not have a united front. Now, if you realize all the observer missions, all of them, Commonwealth, African Union, SADC, uh, um, the Carter Center, EU, they all talked about delimitation. They questioned, why did you go into the election with a delimitation report of this sort? And it would be... Uh, not, you know, savvy for us to then turn around and say, oh no, uh, the election got cheated around the limitation report when we had a chance to make as much noise as possible uh, for us not to participate in a sham of a process, which we are then calling a sham of a process after having sanitized it through our participation as political parties. However, we are not saying uh, we are there to say which hunting uh, to, 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 to try and find blame on a certain individual. No, no, that's not the point. The point is, let us concede, let us realize what we've done wrong, particularly as an opposition, so that we can do these things better. Right now, we are confronted with a serious situation where we are likely going to have uh, uh, the same delimitation report that was used to rig 
to massively rig this election uh, to be used against uh, again in the next election. And as I, as, as I close my submissions, I will do that with the use of uh, examples of things that really happened um, with the uh, delimitation report. Now, the two most important things to any electoral process are the delimitation report and, of course, the voters' role. The two things are, uh, they are two sides of one coin. Now, when we saw the movement of electoral boundaries two weeks before polling, that was delimitation. That is called delimitation. When we saw the addition of polling stations, about 1,500 of them, two weeks before the election, that is called delimitation. So what that means is delimitation was not completed when, uh, when, when government uh, gazetted uh, delimitation. It was not only faulty, but it was illegal. It was against Section 161 of our Constitution. And the reason why we see these things, our estimation is that the military, after having co committed uh, the most grave of all offenses, which is to submit the will, uh, uh, subvert the will of the people, subvert the people's constitution, in 2017, they have obviously clung on to power. They didn't do that to just go back to the barracks and relax there. They are there to stay. So we have to find each other uh, as political parties, of course, a united front as opposition, but more importantly, uh, confront our fears, confront the elephant in the room, the military, confront Zanupir, but of course, not confront not in the confrontational way, but uh, with the intent to uh, find each other in solutions to where we are going to go as a Thank you so much, uh, Chingitai, uh, for that um, um, articulating, articulation of um, your position as the MTC and probably what uh, you believe are the solutions to Zimbabwe's uh, crisis. Uh, and I see there are no more requests uh, to speak. Uh, if there are any, please kindly send them through right now. But in the meantime, I think we'll just have to wrap up. Uh, this has been a very, very interesting discussion, and, and I think it will inform um, the authorities, it will inform um, the SADAC itself on the need for an urgent resolution of Zimbabwe's challenges. I think what really came out very clear was that Zimbabwe needs dialogue. Uh, whatever happens, there is need for inclusive dialogue a uh, dialogue that involves everyone, dialogue that gets everyone to commit to taking Zimbabwe out of this challenge that it, it, it is in. There was just a clear um, articulation that uh, the situation that we are in as a country, if it remains like that, it can only lead to further isolation. It can only lead to Zimbabwe's political and economic uh, situation going worse. And... Um, I think there was a clear indication that we need transitional justice as a country. And uh, I think that really, really stood out. Uh, so I think that has been a very interesting discussion. We we'll meet again on Tuesday. We'll have another Twitter Spaces discussion. This is part of the process to try to get every Zimbabwean speaking about the situation, to try and uh, track... Um, and find out where are we as a country, what um, do we need to do going forward, what can we expect from SATAC, what can we expect from uh, the AU, what can we expect from the international community, because clearly the situation that we are in is not a normal situation, it is a situation that needs um, all of us as Zimbabweans, uh, it is a situation that needs uh, the region, that needs SADAC, that needs countries in SADAC, that needs even citizens of SADAC to support Zimbabwe uh, to move out of this situation. So I will thank you once again uh, for being part of this conversation. And uh, like I said earlier on, let's meet on Tuesday uh, for another discussion as we try to map out what we need as a country, where we need to go as a country, because clearly we need to move out of this. Thank you once again. Oh, uh, yeah, if you miss the question.
Okay, if that is okay. Okay, you can go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, it is a question really to the topic when I read the topic. I might have missed a few things. What crisis is in Zimbabwe? I don't know. I might have missed it. What is the crisis? Is it in your head or my head? What, what crisis? Sorry. I stick to understand. So I host, think... Host, I, may I respond to the gentleman? Okay, please, you can go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, taxi driver, <laughs> with all due respect, uh, if you're going to come on a platform like this where people are discussing crisis, surely, unless if you showed up at the late stage when we heard two minutes of this wonderful space, then I would revert you back to listen to the recording because everything that you're asking there has been spoken about in this recording. So it's now up to you not to take us back, but to literally go back when the space ends and listen to the crisis, the issues that have been raised by very important, learned people on this space. Um, that's my response to you, taxi driver. So and if I we could do I, that, I, I, I because the host, the host has already said, that this space this will be running every single Tuesday, which is fantastic. I'm a but for you, just uh, come onto the space at this current point in time, which is what you do from time to time, is to divert us from what is going on. My advice would be, for now, let us allow the space to close. You can listen to the recording, and then you understand the crisis that people have been mentioning. We don't need to repeat ourselves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Salan, for that very, very um, comprehensive and very uh, key response. Uh, I think uh, it is clear that in, in Zimbabwe we are having a crisis. Uh, so goodbye, everyone. Thank you.